Let's talk about the design of the dome and specifically about the design of the dome shell and the process of the design. I tried to gather some images that would show the process, the timeline. It's still going to be quite confusing, mostly because yes, there is a process, there is a timeline and things going forward and it makes sense. But what makes it so confusing and what really strikes me when I see this collection of images is that there are so many different inputs and requirements and things to keep in mind while designing this set. Uh, of course, it starts with a concept art, which is incredibly useful. Great concept art done by David Revoir that I always kept in mind and always used to try and not lose track of the whole picture of the project. Uh, project meaning the single set. But still, while going on doing environment modeling, you have to detail a lot, do a lot of small stuff and try to make things look real. And it's really easy to lose track. So concept art is your best ally to keep things reasonable and not get lost. But another important input was the real world measurements and the real world set. This image is from uh, OpenStreetMaps. You see the bitmap uh, below and then the curves, the vector was imported to extrude the buildings and then I traced the map of the floor plan of the church to see how the dome would intersect and the placement of the dome was set in, a, in one of the concepts, in a top view and then one of the first things I did was to try and get some elevation and see how the buildings and the stuff in, in height would intersect with uh, the dome. There's also another source of material. These are some of my very few uh, sketches which have nothing to do with proper work of a concept artist who pre-visualize the final impact and the whole picture. What it is just uh, doodling and try to think how the shapes, colors and the final impact that you can see uh, very well in the concept, how would that translate into an actual architecture. So what you see here is actually much closer to the final frame compared to uh, my sketches that are just black and white front orthographic views but I was looking at the patterns that you can see here, these Y-shaped beams with a triangle pointing downwards, white, so very visible, and then some uh, minor shapes that are inverted with triangle pointing upwards, and sometimes they create some hexagons when they are combined together. And I wanted to keep that, and get that look and that final result and effect into some shapes that were actual beams with their nuts and bolts and a uh, sense of construction. So one other example is this was done much later on when I had already done some modules for the base of the dome and it's another example of how concept of uh, sketching can be useful uh, it's not properly a concept because I had already designed the base but I wasn't happy with it. I went back on it and just doodled by hand so that I was freer because again mesh modeling for environments is technical drawing. It is efficient, precise, you can then animate your stuff, that's the most important thing, but also you can draw with precision and detail but it also sort of limits you and keeps you, uh, tempts you to use always the same quick set of commands like extruding, like working on a grid of quads. And instead, if you uh, do some sketches by hand, you are much freer to design some elements that are way more uh, original. And then this is the very first a CG test render of the dome. It's 
not really even a design, it's just a technical device to get have one module I could work on with a very simple Y beam and then arrays and simple uh, deform modifiers. So I could tap into edit mode, add some detail to the module, then tap out of edit mode and see the whole structure and it would reflect the changes on the design. Then I went on detailing it a bit more, already dividing it into uh, these two areas correspond to the line where the cranes are. And after this one, I went on for a, one more test with some more light. This is of course nothing to do with light design. It's just trying to see the volumes using light. And so something like this paint stroke, these shapes, trying to turn them into not just color, but also volumes and see how this main beam that was white in the sketches, then it becomes bigger and more close to camera and the secondary shapes are just recessed. But then after this, I realized that something was still missing from the concept. So I went back just doodling. This is terrible, actually. This is an old, old band. But I was trying to think about the upwards and downwards modules and how they create hexagons. And I, I could make a simple design that would recreate those kind of patterns that you see in the concepts. And then after many iterations, it progressively went towards the final version of the dome, where there's also color involved to get the different layers of the dome looking nice with each other. And yeah, the layers, uh, at some point, when this design of the Y beams and the structure was starting to work, I started to think that, okay, we had one layer of beams and then a layer for the background of those that was a simple uh, icosphere geodesic dome. And so why not having also a foreground layer? Midground, background, why not foreground? And also looking at the concept that was the projectors and the, the projectors. There was the projections, so why not have some projectors for them uh, along the surface of the dome? And so I started designing this panels. The first version actually is not like you see it here. This is the latest version. But the first version you can see here is just the base structure. Then to give it a bit more depth, I started removing these panels in between the beams and replacing them with a shell. And then I, the first thing I did was creating this grid that was meant to be a third layer that would add some complexity and if not parallax, because this is far away and relatively thin compared to the distance to camera, if not parallax, it would add some variation and some silhouette. But then this grid version was covering definitely too much of the main structure that was still supposed to be the Y beams, that was supposed to be the pattern most visible and it was working better than this simple hexagon pattern. And so then I changed them into individual panels with, with a very thin connecting structure that would show more of the beams. And at this point, the structure was starting to work and I then worked on the materials to try to get uh, the beams to show more and the panels to be uh, a bit darker and the background to be the darkest. With the added complexity that when I say light and dark, uh, we have to deal with not just the diffuse channel, but there's also the specular and it's like two variables that sometimes are really difficult to tune together. And the more probably uh, I have this impression that the more physical the render engine gets, uh, the also the more differences you get between one shot and the other, one light setup and the other. And these panels were 
especially uh, tough for this because depending on the amount of uh, diffuse and specular they can look good or this dash of color which makes sense to have a grayish very washed out tone all over and then some more saturated stronger colors for the panels uh, it's a good thing it should work it works except that in some light situations where you have a lot of diffuse this color pops out too much and then you get a very different look and this is something that has to do with well with the ray tracing so there was uh, really so much uh, so many aspects involved with designing the dome from sketching and, and drawing and concept art to architecture and taking accurate measurements and dealing with real-world data to then uh, efficiently modeling things the, from the poly count to handling a big scene to then even the aspects of uh, ray tracing and material creation and texturing etc. And here are a few more images with interesting anecdotes on uh, measurements and r modeling real world places. This is the church, of course, the tower modeled by Ian and the base model of the facades and the plan that I modeled based on the plans that Rob got from the Conservation Historical Society of the church itself. And then later Rob modeled all the interior and got more data from them. But this shows uh, the tower, as I said, with this image that we got after Ian modeled the tower only looking at photographs, we got this drawing and so when checking that the tower would match, and it did, it was working perfectly for the purpose of a movie, and also what was the real world size of this platform, because the scene in which Parley and Tom are standing on, in the tower was going to be shot in a green screen studio but we had to see if it would make any uh, physical sense to have the two characters standing in here and if this was a 2 by 2 meters platform or 15 by 15 it was then something around 7 by 7 which was exactly what we had pictured and what was uh, intended for the scene. Then you see other images and other reference material. This one is interesting because it's actually a toy, a paper model of the church that you can buy in the church itself, but it's incredibly useful material for making a model. It's based on a technical drawing, 1 to 100 to 200 scale technical drawing of the church, more or less accurate, but most important, it's consistent. All the various planes and surfaces of the church are drawn at the same scale and this speeds up the modeling process a lot to have this kind of matching references. In the end, I've been trying to find as much data and measurements as I could. While uh, it's also possible to go just looking at photos and not wait for the data but start modeling right away which can make sense especially for the tower where the shape was more or less simple than with a lot of details and it's way more complicated for a shape that has more planes and surfaces and fronts and different facades etc and in the end the question for the reason for getting better uh, reference material and drawings is not that much the accuracy that for a movie that is not an historical reconstruction you can with a good eye for proportion do a really good job but it's the speed and all the time that you spend thinking and wondering and trying to make different pieces match it really helped later on we got even more detailed proper uh, DWG uh, unfortunately AutoCAD drawings but proper vector architect drawings for the fronts and the inside and that I think really helped not to get lost in the modeling of that interior. Another interesting case is the vertices you see here 
is the points of the open street map plan of Amsterdam that we used as first base reference for modeling the area around the Oudekerk and the bridge. And this image was done, then printed on paper to then uh, uh, go take on-site measurements. I did that with a tape measure and a laser meter and then you can see here this is instead the bridge from the breakup scene shot on location. This location wasn't available so we shot here and I did these measurements for Sebastian to uh, help the tracking because we had already um, discussed and sorted out these measurements and when we were doing it the first time for this bridge at some point we were wondering what was going to be better the tracking data the reconstruction data from tracking from the footage or on-site measurements uh, you can guess that on-site measurement take a long time and if they are accurate but then the model is not ensured that it would match with the footage it's no point it being more accurate so we did a bit of both and then we confronted it the reality was that it was perfectly complementary uh, what you get from uh, uh, measurements is this kind of dimensions fixed dimensions that well one or two are enough then to scale accurately uh, a good reconstruction but also then does the question that the reconstruction loses some precision over distance from camera but then it gets things like the curvature of this bridge i've been able to take these measurements in half an hour alone with a laser meter and a tape measure to dangle it and get the height from the water level the water plane is a reference as a zero point and in half an hour i could get this base measurements but if i needed to get the curvature exactly of this bridge that would have taken quite a bit more measurements or a lot of guessing looking at photos and trying to find the correct shape of this curve with the tracking data instead you get all the details all the shapes and with some just a few numeric values taken on site you can then scale and correct and get a pretty decent reconstruction of the set And back to the design aspects, the dome shell was the most complicated part, then the stuff inside the dome was, well, the facades, for example, they didn't need to be designed, it was mostly a question of getting correct measurements, uh, finding out how to make materials and make the damage realistic, and also the other pieces, most, more than being a question of uh, design, was a question of getting a reference for a good crane, for a good... Uh, silo etc and then placing them around distributing them around the dome uh, based mostly on which camera angles were the most important which areas would, were going to be seen the most and for example this is the east side of the canal which is the background for the breakup scene and instead of the west side of the canal uh, is not going to be seen in many shots and for example the boat had to be placed it has been in this area next to the church and then it be moved to the other side of the church in the end so for example this facade the one on the side here of the west facade for a very long time was uh, supposed not to be seen in any shot then at some point when the boat went here, it turned out it might have become an important uh, background uh, and then in, actually the matte painting for the boat ended up being in this area. Uh, so it was mostly a question of distributing things and then in fact you see this 360 panorama helped me to try and get an idea of how much in percentage of the horizon of the dome was facades and how much was going to be filled with Michelinos, technology, machinery, etc. And then this is the same thing with um, some references. 
uh, well, actually, the, the references used for the dome were way more than what you see here. But I just, at some point, I just tried to put them together to get an idea, again, of the amount uh, of things needed and distribute the work between the different areas, not focusing too much on something that might have been then not that important. Then the mood board is not complete. I would generally just pick the image, show it to other people in the team to get an idea, to get approved and discuss the references. And then in the weekly, just show the uh, result model. But you can see there's some pictures of Amsterdam that I just took going around the city. Some just technical or various drawings of machinery to use as reference. And then some images from uh, especially interesting are those blogs about uh, urban exploration with uh, this rundown, decayed buildings, um, peculiar sites around the world that really give some interesting reference images for this kind of environments. Then these slides will be useful for later videos because this is about the uh, various steps building the west facades and it's mostly about materials and textures. So for now I'll stick to the design questions. And like this crane was just modeled from scratch without any, re um, well, much reference, not an exact reference for the crane itself, but uh, partial references for all the pieces. Like this shape here is taken from some cranes and hooks that are normally used in, in Amsterdam. You see this kind of shape um, hanging from the facade sometimes. And also this computer was just imagine vaguely the shape and then started building it in uh, directly in Blender. But there are a couple of pieces for the dome that have been sketched before modeling. Uh, this one and these other ones. And these are interesting because again make me think about sketching and modeling and the way that working freehand helps you be more free in designing and you can see the differences. There are a few things in this sketch that still are missing from the CG model and that happens unfortunately all the time unless you do uh, lots and lots of iteration and go back and spend a lot of time redoing everything until everything is always absolutely perfect. But you can see, for example, this panel uh, that I was sketched for then being here as front of the this projector uh, pole. It's very different than around in here. And that's because I really like this design and I really wanted it to be on the front. But then at the practical act of modeling this thing, I realized I had already something like 15 or 20 uh, sci-fi Michelinos panels to use around. And so I just picked one of the existing ones and slammed it on the front without spending all the time needed for a new design. Vice versa here, there's a simple uh, pivot junction and I realized I could used one of the gribble pieces I already made, which had way more interesting shape with a lot of stuff going on. But you can see that it's the same piece that you can find in this computer here. And again, uh, these two pieces and all these Michelinos, antennas and cables that were planned to be placed around the arm of this projector crane thing, I have been replaced with a much simpler, uh, in a way, more streamlined, more solid design. And this is, again, a, a piece of gribble kit that was already prepared. And yeah, well, this is something that part is, I think, natural to the tool. When you work with uh, mesh modeling, you tend to make things a bit more compact mostly because the making small shapes and complex silhouettes is a pain to UV 
and to make materials for if you then want to have something like a dirt map, an ambient occlusion map, and sometimes you can get away with um, box mapping and no specific texturing, but get the silhouette of the object more interesting. That can be a, a really good way to solve things. But sometimes you unconsciously try to simplify the shapes so that then you can do a proper material and maybe unwrap it and pack it and uh, make it work technically better. Most of the time it takes a bit more time to try and work without thinking of the shortest path for modeling, but then you get better uh, looking designs. But I like to confront these sketches because you see that a lot of things that were good ideas in the sketches were cut. <laughs> the corners were cut while modeling and they don't end up being in the final CG. And another example is this projector. Uh, the idea well, was very simply the idea of a camera tripod. But you can see there's this detail like the cable around the main stick and this sort of box with antennas that in the end I decided to simplify and I just extruded a few handles and extruded again following a simpler path to getting these details. But on the other hand, yeah, this shape for the top part, it was actually came out as a design because of the ease of modeling a curved surface with subdivision surfaces while uh, sketching this on paper, an orthographic view wouldn't tell you much. A perspective is sort of complicated to think in perspective, a shape like this, while it actually just came out while playing with, uh, with a sphere with subdivision surfaces and pulling vertices and getting still a, a smooth surface. Another object that I first uh, drew on paper, I actually modeled a very simple version of these things that are on at the end of the canal. But then I stopped and went to do some sketching. And I knew that I, if I started modeling this shape in CG without a sketch, I would have then probably done a very simple and not realistic pattern of beams and divisions in the metal. So I just went and tried to sketch and think more about the construction and not the topology, the real world construction and not the CG topology when designing the connectors and the inside elements of this structure. And yeah, one last item of design is this thing you see here. This was the idea, the base idea for these panels on top of the uh, projectors. You can see this sketch matches more or less what you see here. But then I did that other sketch and that was, I think, way more interesting than what you see here. But again, when I got to the practical act of modeling this thing, I decided how much time I had and I'm, my, how many hours I wanted to spend on this thing. And so I decided to just pick one of the panels that were already modeled for the dome, make it smaller and make one sort of leaf item and copy it three times and get the panel done. But I must say that also this idea of an inner circle with some detail and an outer circle with some random looking sections and panels would have been quite interesting. And this is a kind of stuff that you can go on and do infinite number of revision and tweakings of your design and models if you have the time, of course. And that's it for these videos. I think also I'm done with the overview generic videos and from the next one will be more technical questions about the materials and